West Africa is that part of Africa between the Sahara Desert and the Atlantic Ocean. Civilization emerged there many centuries before Columbus reached America. There were towns, business ventures, mining, law courts, empires, hundreds of thousands of square miles where most people went about their daily lives and traveled in safety. The civilization first appeared on the Sahel, meaning the shore, so called because the Sahel faced an ocean of rock and sand, the greatest desert on earth. Arabs, when they encountered it, named it the nothingness. In Arabic, Sahara. The Sahel itself is a vast expanse of parched soils, low in organic and mineral content. None of the advantages that had made ancient Egyptian civilization possible obtained here. Ancient Egyptian civilization rested on a strong foundation. Its food grains hardly ever went thirsty. The River Nile saw to this. Also, the grains never went hungry. Every year, the Nile provided food for them, silt. Seen here after centuries of thick buildup, the Nile silt was a fertilizer containing organic substances and minerals collected from millions of square miles of Africa's forests, swamps, and mountain streams and the river itself undertook the task of spreading the fertilizer over the land to be cultivated. Human energy was not required for this. In the Sahara's borderlands, where West Africa's largest empires developed, conditions were different. Some years, there was almost no rain. Even West Africa's major river, the Niger, contained just inches of water in parts of the Sahel during the dry season. Some years people could walk across without their feet getting wet. The Niger carries relatively little silt from its birthplace among mountain boulders. It travels inland, away from the sea, for a thousand miles through the savanna grasslands. Here, visible from space, is seen its further passage through the Sahel and towards the Sahara. Entering the Sahel, as indicated by the arrow at the left, the gradient drops into a broad depression which floods during the rainy season to create the fertile green area known as the Inland Delta. The outflow continues to the desert edge, along which it runs for a few hundred miles before bending southward in another thousand-mile transit back once more through the Sahel and the savannah, before re-entering the coastal rainforest and emptying into the sea. In ancient Egypt, wheat and barley, watered by the Nile and fed by that river's ample silt, fed the officials, the architects, the artisans, the teams of laborers, the clergy, the numbers of people involved in heavy construction, Wheat and barley were the grain-bearing grasses that also fed Mesopotamia and would feed ancient India and the Roman Empire. Wheat and barley do not do well in the Sahel. They become diseased. It is a wonder that people were able to establish themselves as farmers on such a harsh land and even to produce a surplus to feed townspeople, thereby making civilization possible. They identified native wild grain-bearing grasses which were acclimatized, and they improved their yield. One was millet, another sorghum. Whatever amount of rain falls in the Sahel, it falls on only about 30 days, all within a period of four months. 
For eight months of the year, no rain at all is expected. The dry season. The sun bakes the soil. A gritty wind blows ceaselessly in from the desert. Every last bit of moisture is blown from the air. Millet and sorghum produce a volume of seed per acre in West Africa that is a fraction of the volume of seed which the ancient Egyptians were able to obtain. For fertilizer, West Africans had to manage as best they could with ashes from burnt grass and brush, with kitchen waste, with animal manure, if available. They dug ever deeper for water. They drew it from wet season pools and dry season wells. They carried it to each group of plants. Sometimes feeding their animals meant shaking leaves from a tree. West Africans found ways to manage the shortage and expense of fertilizer. One way was to rest exhausted fields until these had recovered their natural fertility. At the same time, clearing, hoeing and planting rested land or new land. Another way of making up for the shortage of fertilizer was to rotate crops with different nutritional requirements on the same piece of land. One year a crop that drew mostly on certain nutriments, the following year a different crop that fed on other nutriments. There were combinations of methods. One 13th century West African emperor is said to have maintained an experimental farm which grew a variety of cereals and fruits. A British agricultural agent sent in 1939 to inspect an area with a view to teaching the people there to follow better methods reported back that the agriculture department had nothing to teach these people. Some people on the Sahel did no farming. These were the Fulani. People with herds of cattle, of sheep and goats, always on the move. Rest stops were temporary. After grazing each place bare, their animals had to move on. The herding people had to move with them. Their animals provided milk and hides, enough for themselves, enough to bring to a village market like these Fulani milkmaids hoping to return to their encampments, perhaps with grain obtained from farmers, or cloth woven by settled people with looms. Some people neither farmed nor herded but made their living from the fish in the Niger. They also moved as the schools of fish moved upstream and downstream. Most of the fish they caught, they dried for barter and sale. Fish helped to compensate, but only partly to compensate, for a shortage in West Africa perhaps as great an obstacle to human survival there as the shortage of water, the scarcity of salt. Salt is a dietary essential. If the bodies of vertebrates which contain it are unavailable for consumption, salt then must be obtained from a mineral source. But it must be obtained. When many centuries ago the curtain rises on our awareness of West African civilization, a great salt trade was already in operation. Salt caravans, consisting sometimes of thousands of camels, were bringing the mineral into the Sahel from mines deep in the Sahara. 
a salt cellar. So important was salt to the people of the dry hot Sahel, it was reported that when they ate bread, they always licked a piece of salt. It was accepted as money. Travelers paid for all kinds of food from people along the wayside with pieces of salt. How the trade in salt began, which required so much else to have begun, is unknown. How were the myriad connections developed between the unrelated peoples who went on to construct West African civilization? This is equally unknown. Written descriptions begin only during the second act, long after towns had come into existence and the first empires had been established. They must have taken place throughout an area half the size of the United States. Innumerable first encounters between individuals who worked through the obstacle of mutually unintelligible languages and learned to supply each other's needs. This, despite differences also in color. Ethnicity. And religion. There were differences in dress and adornment. There were women clothed from head to feet, and men who were veiled. There were some, including daughters of emperors, who were hardly clothed at all. Shocking to the adherents of Islam, who saw the majority of the people as idol worshippers, their treasured images blasphemous. Religious and cultural differences were potentially divisive, yet these differences, even the religious differences, were subordinated to a consciousness of interdependence and the rule of law. We see this from a Muslim's 11th century description of Ghana, a kingdom larger than France, but with little surface water or rain. The capital's water supply for people and vegetables came from wells. The king was not a Muslim, nor were most of his subjects. The Muslim minority attended several mosques in their residential quarter of the capital, practicing their religion without interference. Indeed, an additional mosque was provided outside the Muslim quarter and near the royal palace for the benefit of Muslims who were in the administration and visitors who had business at court. Muslim administrators and visitors were further accommodated in court ritual. Muslims bowed to God in daily prayer. They were excused from prostrating themselves before the ruler and sprinkling dust over their heads. A ritual of respect for royalty common throughout West Africa where the ruler as in ancient Egypt was regarded as embodying the divine. Instead, they were permitted simply to clap their hands. Accommodation was a mutual interest. No angry sermons appear to have been issued from the mosques condemning what Muslims viewed as the idolatrous practices of the Salinke people and their kings. The reason was gold. News of the economic importance of Ghana as the land of gold had reached the imperial Arab court in Baghdad during the century following the birth of Islam. Thereafter, a Muslim community had established itself in Ghana's capital, engaging in purchase of gold and other West African products and their export to North Africa. The Muslims were completely dependent on West African middlemen for this business. As the location of the distant mines and river gravels where gold was dug and panned was kept secret.
But the Sedinke were dependent on Muslims for the most critical necessity of all, salt. Its transportation into the kingdom from deep in the desert was the work of the Tuareg. Descendants of the prehistoric Berber population of North Africa. They were converted to Islam by the Arabs. They were nomads, their home in the desert, for which, unlike the Arabs, they had no single name. Instead, they spoke of the deserts. For each desert, as they saw it, they had a specific name. From the Arabs, the Tuareg and other Berbers had acquired a new religion and a new animal, which provided them with their food, their shelter, their means of transport, and life support in an emergency, from water squeezed from the bowels of a slaughtered animal. The camel was more suited for desert travel than the horses and bullocks of times past. Each camel could carry a fifth of a ton in two great slabs of salt, each weighing 200 pounds. And so, from the 8th century even to the present, camel caravans have been on the move to towns on the desert shore for offloading, salt to be cut up there for local customers, and packed with other goods on mules for transport south, until Tsetse-infested country was reached, where head-loaded porters would take over. This trade could be disturbed by the vicissitudes of empire in the western Sudan. In the 13th century, Ghana, the victim both of invasions and the southward march of the desert, was deserted by its merchants and disappeared, after more than six centuries as an organizing force. Yet the fishermen's need to trade peacefully with strangers for grain and milk did not disappear. Nor did the concern of shepherds for the inviolability of their flocks, nor the need for markets that women could attend in safety without worrying that their gold ornaments would be stolen from their ears and the goods from their heads. In the year 1265, hoping to re-establish a zone of security and commerce, people gathered behind the Catus, a Malinke family from a small town in the savannah. Within a century, the Empire of Mali reached the Atlantic in the west, from there extended eastward for 1,200 miles, encompassing an area as large as Texas and California combined. It incorporated territories that were never part of ancient Ghana, the great bend of the Niger River, the river's fertile inland delta, the gold fields along the river's headwaters, a much greater diversity of languages and beliefs than Ghana's was the result. Mali's founding dynasty, the Kaitas, had adopted Islam. As a religion not tied to any one ethnic or racial group, Islam could contribute to the cohesiveness of a multi-ethnic empire. It helped the Kaitas rule Mali for a period longer than that of any ancient Egyptian dynasty. No jihad would be waged against them like the jihad launched by desert nomads against ancient Ghana, which, though short-lived, had contributed to that state's downfall. The Kaitas of Owl of Islam entitled them to appoint the Imams, the chief religious authorities of the Muslim population, in commercial centers like Timbuktu. This tightened their control. None of the imams appointed by emperors of Mali and Timbuktu were drawn from the foreign Muslim community which monopolized the trans-Saharan trade. All were West Africans. These imams came from a small but growing indigenous Muslim population whose forerunners were Malinki traders. Wherever their business carried them, these traders sought converts. 
Islam created bonds of hospitality and trust with the converts with whom they dealt, overcoming differences in language and custom. But the majority of Mali's people lived outside the towns. They had less contact with strangers and kept faith with the religions of their parents and grandparents. Some acknowledged in their prayers a God who changes everything, who leaves nothing similar. Those who shed tears will laugh. Those who laugh will shed tears. Give us peace. Give us what we do not have. Let the millet ripen. Let the good rains come. Despite their identity as Muslims, Mali's emperors could hardly turn their backs on the beliefs and customs of the majority of their subjects. Just as God's messenger in Islam was in contact with an angel and engaged in a miraculous flight to heaven and back, Sunniyata, founder of the empire of Mali and a Muslim, was and is remembered in the traditions of the people of Mali as a powerful magician who performed miracles. Throwing dust over one's head while prostrating oneself before his descendant, the king, was an act of submission performed in Mali and in other West African states by people whose conception of the supernatural was as meaningful to them as that sanctioned by Islam. But those Muslims, especially from North Africa, not linked through ancestry to the traditions of Mali, did not see it that way. The challenge of the Keita dynasty was to maintain legitimacy in both worlds. Several made the pilgrimage to Mecca. Under their patronage, mosques were built throughout the empire, small ones in country towns, large structures, some now world heritage sites in the major towns. The great mosques in Timbuktu were not only places of worship but centers of learning where the Quran and Islamic law were studied by both foreign and West African scholars along with medicine, mathematics, astronomy, geography and other subjects. Thousands of books and pages of manuscripts written and copied there are now the object of an international preservation effort. But the Cadiz also understood that while their authority did require regular attendance at the Friday Mosque, it also derived from rituals recognized as proper by the non-Muslim subjects and considered improper by Muslims. So it was that after Friday service, even after the festival service that ended Ramadan fast, there followed at court amidst the glitter of gold and silver weaponry and jewelry, with ranked army officers, governors and official visitors seated according to protocol, a traditional service with sermons delivered by men in wooden masks. These vile practices, in the opinion of a North African witness, culminated in food being brought in to break the fast by completely naked young women. This North African was Ibn Battuta. A devout Muslim, he had spent much of his lifetime traveling throughout the 14th century Islamic world, from Spain to India. His final journey was to Mali. In the first Malian town that he reached after his nearly three-month-long desert crossing, he was disconcerted to see that the Muslim women there were not veiled, and not only not secluded, but felt free to entertain male guests in their houses without a chaperone. But against this, and other of his negative impressions, he found less evidence of corruption in Mali than he had encountered elsewhere and wrote that its people had, quote, a greater abhorrence of injustice, unquote, than any people he had come across in his travels. An escort had guarded his caravan across the desert, but once in Mali, he found himself able to journey across the empire for more than a thousand miles without a guard, 
and with only a guide to show the way. There is complete security in their country, he wrote. Neither traveler nor inhabitant in it has anything to fear from robbers or men of violence. They do not confiscate the property of any white man who dies in their country, even if it be uncounted wealth. On the contrary, they give it into the charge of some trustworthy person among the whites until the rightful heir takes possession of it. Mali was a trading empire. Investors and their creditors reckoned the expense of organizing camel trains with their drivers, guards, guides, and supplies for the desert crossing. A long time would elapse between an investment and its anticipated return. Risk was harder to calculate. Raids against caravans were conducted by desert nomads against whom it was hoped that guards would be effective. Guards were ineffective against sandstorms. As recently as 1805, a caravan of 2,000 men and 1,800 camels perished in the desert without a survivor. Salt was the essential import, but the caravans brought many other items from North Africa and Southern Europe. European cloth, perfumes, silks, books, beads, horses, copper rods, weapons, cowrie shells. Cowrie shells were used ornamentally and as small denomination currency in the markets. All other imports from across the desert were luxuries, beyond the reach of the majority of the population, except for salt. Even so, salt was a great expense, increasing in price at each stage of the distribution network. Horses were required for the military, and were prestige items of the high and mighty, as were the European cloths, silks, and perfumes. Caravans heading back into the desert carried West African exports. Gold was the main export. Gold dust was used in Mali as large denomination currency, and was made into jewelry. During the 14th century, it is estimated that Mali accounted for two-thirds of world production, supplying both the mints of the Muslim world as well as those of late medieval Europe. Initially, mining and panning occurred only within the empire. Subsequently, new sources were discovered in the forest kingdoms far to the south. From there, it was conveyed to Jenny on the inland delta. Then further, by Niger River traffic, together with ostrich feathers, cloth, ivory, ebony, pepper, hides and kola nuts, to Timbuktu at the desert's edge for transfer to the caravans heading north. Kola nuts were a mild, expensive stimulant substituting in wealthy Muslim households for prohibited alcohol. Though only the few could afford the imports and exports that passed through Mali's towns, the basic needs of their residents created opportunities for the less well-off. Everyone required grain. How rural families who had always worked flat out in the growing season and who always needed the cooperation of the weather and the insect world just to make it to the next harvest managed to produce a surplus sufficient to keep the towns alive is remarkable. The urban market demanded meat and milk, as well as replacements for transport animals. Customers looked out for the fisher folk, who doubled also as river transporters, hauling in loads of wood for cooking. A ready market existed for blacksmiths, yoke makers, rope makers. The spread of Islam stimulated the local market for clothing. In Timbuktu were numerous textile establishments. 
Ibn Battuta, in his travel through Mali, even saw a weaver who had set up his loom in the hollow of a baobab tree and was actually weaving, rent-free. Export and import taxes furnished part of the imperial revenue. Salt, for example, was taxed upon import from the north and taxed again on loads exported to the south. The treasury of at least one ruler contained a storeroom filled with salt. Revenue was augmented by tribute collected from subordinate rulers who otherwise ran their own affairs. But as in ancient Egypt, the biggest business in Mali was a conglomerate owned by the ruler and operated by his staff. The emperor held a near monopoly on strategic imports such as metals and horses. Twenty slaves purchased one horse. Where did the slaves come from? Paradoxically, a portion of the resources underpinning the peacefulness and administration of justice that Ibn Battuta found so striking in Mali rested on raiding for slaves. Slaves worked the emperor's farms to feed his household and to feed his standing army. Others to cut grass for the emperor's horses yet others to thatch the royal houses. Some were established as fishing communities, obligated to provide the state with bundles of dried fish. Slaves were to be seen everywhere in Mali. Young men born into slavery were considered good material for training as infantry in the imperial army. They had no choice but obey orders, no extended family to watch over their interests. Young women slaves could wind up with a camel caravan on the months-long slog through the desert. Upon Ibn Battuta's return journey to Morocco, 600 slave girls accompanied his caravan, heading for sail and fates unknown. Five weeks' journey northward into the Sahara lay the Tagaza salt mines. The water there was brackish. The place was plagued with flies. Nothing grew there, not even a tree. Food for the slaves who hauled the naturally shaped salt slabs to the surface depended on the safe arrival of caravans. Slave raiding, slave trading, and slave holding were not unique to Mali. The historian Robert Davis of Ohio State University has calculated that in the years from 1500 to 1800, between one million and one and a quarter million Europeans were brought to North Africa as slaves. In Brazil, slavery continued to within 12 years of the 20th century. Slavery was an outgrowth of civilization, initially a less brutal and more rational solution than killing or maiming captives as the state was unable or unwilling to afford the upkeep of POW camps and prisons. Once the economic benefits were experienced, slave raiding followed. Yet no racial stigma attached to slaves in Mali. The emperors were black, the slaves were black. As in Tudor England, where kings and queens placed commoners in the highest administrative offices. The emperors of Mali also sought to increase their own power by filling high administrative and military offices from among the royal domestic slaves who could be counted on to be more dependable because unlike nobles and freemen, they had no independent support base in a clan or in a province. Indeed, twice former slaves became rulers of the empire. Once when an unresolved succession struggle between freeborn princes left an opening for an army general, a freed slave, to make himself emperor. And a century later, when the incompetence of a Keta emperor resulted in power being transferred to the head of the court slaves. These two occasions were interruptions in the dominance of the Keta dynasty. But fighting over the succession between Sundiata's descendants was endemic. Competing wives, many princes, meant reoccurring trouble. 
No emperor of Mali solved this problem by having all his brothers killed, as was ordered by King Solomon of ancient Israel, himself the product of a harem. Nor did Mali develop a constitutional solution similar to that of the Yoruba kingdom of Oyo, which bordered the rainforest of the far south. In Oyo, a state council chose each king's successor. This council in turn was checked by another government body. It also had the power to depose a king who proved incompetent or lawless. By the middle of the 15th century, Mali's government was so weakened by bitter succession struggles that tribute-paying populations seized the opportunity to cease paying. Raiders from the desert and the savannah attacked. Timbuktu, Jenny, and the entire middle Niger River region was lost. The empire continued to shrink until all that was left was the core Keita chieftaincy from which the work of empire building had begun two centuries before. But empire building began again. This time a different people, the Songhe, took the lead. They were able to bring an area of more than 400,000 square miles, larger than Mali at its strongest, under the control of their leader and commander, Sunni Ali. He organized so-called fishermen into a navy, whose operations to capture towns along the Niger were so successful that he considered building a canal to enable them to capture a key town 200 miles across the desert, rather than attempt the exhausting march with a land force. Although nominally a Muslim, Sunni Ali, like the emperors of Mali before him, kept one foot planted in the traditional religion and did not hesitate to wreak vengeance on Muslims, including scholars, whom he believed had sided with his enemies. They reviled him as a brutal idol worshipper. Not surprisingly, there are sharp disagreements about many facts of his life and death between Muslim scholars living and writing in Timbuktu and the Bard or Griots, who from generation to generation conveyed through recitation and song what they believed the facts to be. The Griots proclaim that he was assassinated by a nephew, the future emperor, Askia Muhammad I, who is the hero of the Timbuktu historians. One of them attributes Sunni Ali's death not to murder, but to an illness. Another to an accidental drowning. According to one of their histories, a battle for the imperial seat then ensued between Muhammad and Sunni Ali's own son, Sunni Baru. Before the outbreak of fighting, Muhammad challenged Sunni Baru to declare himself a true Muslim but he refused. The battle began. When the day was done, Sunni Baru was in flight. Askia Muhammad I added the honorific Al-Hajj to his title when as emperor he made pilgrimage to Mecca. Probably he understood better than Sunni Ali's son how the religious balance in Mali was shifting and which was the wealthiest, best connected and most dangerous community. He didn't press conversion on his own subjects forcibly, but on foreign campaigns he burned villages whose inhabitants refused to accept Islam. He also strained the region's tradition of religious tolerance by following the urging of a renowned Muslim scholar and preacher to pronounce jihad against fake Muslims, backsliders and Jews. Jews had lived in West Africa for centuries as goldsmiths and traders. Askia Mohammed required them to convert to Islam or leave. Judaism became illegal in Mali, as it did in Catholic Spain in the same year. The goods of Jews were pillaged, many were killed. It was several centuries before they were allowed to return and build a synagogue. But by then, the empire of Songhe had long disappeared. In 1591, 63 years after the death of Askiyo Muhammad I, 
the empire he and his successors had worked to enlarge and stabilize came to a sudden end, the result of a decision made more than a thousand miles away in Morocco. The Sultan of Morocco, Ahmed al Mansur, believed that his mission was to reunite the world of Islam. As a step forward, he resolved to invade Songhay, acquire its gold mines, and so prepare himself financially for the task of restoring the Caliphate. The outcome of such a step was not in doubt. His forces would have far superior weaponry. 10,000 camels conveying the troops and engineers along with mortars, muskets, ammunition and all needed supplies entered the Sahara on December 22, 1590. Two months later, a lone nomad grazing his animals was startled to see this force emerge over the horizon. After reaching the Niger and a brief rest, the Moroccan force advanced towards the Songhay capital, near which the decisive battle occurred. Songhay's bowmen and cavalry broke under fusillades from muskets and mortars firing stone balls, which the invaders had also brought with them over the desert. News of his army's victory in Bilal al-Sudan, the land of the blacks, caused the Moroccan Sultan to state publicly that unlimited wealth now lay open for the taking. In Timbuktu, his soldiers evicted a merchant from his buildings, which they took over to make into a fortified zone for themselves. They discovered that the town was not El Dorado. El Dorado was not even close. This they had to learn after an exhausting journey across what must have seemed to them an endless wasteland. Their quest for gold became a search for any grain and article of gold in the possession of the town's inhabitants. Some Moroccans got their hands on the metal, but Timbuktu was no gold mine. Neither then nor later were they able to locate where the mines were. Frustration and anger took over. They pillaged and raped. They hadn't considered the consequences. Rioting broke out. In two months, 76 Moroccans lost their lives. Nor did soldiers expect to see disease spreading through their ranks, bringing death to hundreds more of their fellow soldiers. It was a famine year. They killed their transport animals for food. Requested reinforcements sent from Morocco were harassed by the Tuareg on their swift camels, men at home in the desert. Disorder spread throughout the former imperial territory. It had been an easy victory for Morocco, but a painful aftermath. The caliphate was not restored. No large, centrally administered zone of security with as great a diversity of peoples and beliefs reappeared in West Africa. Mali and Songhay were the last. Christianity entered West Africa along its southern shores, spreading through the forests and into the forest kingdoms. The older ways retreated or were forced to retreat both there and on the Sahel and Savannah, where Islam continued its advance. West Africans and those who came to join them from the desert and beyond had constructed a space where from the 13th through the 16th centuries, with one known exception during the administration of Aski and Mohammed I, religious persecution was unknown. It was a multi-racial space. There was no color discrimination. The various communities observed their own rules for marriage, divorce and inheritance. Private property was protected. The empires encompassed a diversity of language. 
and ritual of dress and the lack of it of wealth and the lack of it a diversity held together for centuries over a vast area but not paradise Mali and Songhe had had to survive poor soils, a harsh climate, drought, locust infestation, harvest times with no harvest, and empty granaries. Times when a leader faced problems he could not resolve and was replaced. There were better times. The ruins left by this civilization are scant. Neither Mali nor Songhe could afford constructions like the Egyptian pyramids, buildings seen by both Malian and Songhe emperors who made pilgrimage to Mecca. There remains the burial tomb of Askia Muhammad I, built of wood and mud, 56 feet high, used also as a mosque. There remain other old mosques struggling against the sand. The wheel was known to West Africans through their contacts with and visits to North Africa and elsewhere. But the terrain, the distance, the impossibility of organizing road maintenance when, outside the towns, people lived very far apart. This continued to make the use of one's feet, or those of an animal, the way to go. The only way. Pack animals could only go as far as the Tsetse fly boundary. The empires of the Western Sudan were slave states. Some slaves reached high position, two were emperors. A different kind of slavery than the one we are familiar with. But some or all of the free population accepted and the government encouraged raiding to take captives. Captives who had been free men and women in their own societies probably had fought the attackers, possibly seen family members slaughtered. These people became part of the empire. All the while, people of all kinds, farmers, shepherds, fishermen, saddle makers, Investors in the caravans, elders, lived out their lives, happy for the protection of the state, at peace with their neighbors, generation after generation. A long time ago.